it's very easy to meet people in Nashville that say, I'm so-and-so and I'm so-and-so and I can do this and I can do that. And all it is, is it's empty promises. And, you know, I had a couple of those experiences and it was pretty disheartening. But if you just stick with it, you eventually find those people who are for real. And you start getting with the people who can help guide you down the path that's going to be best to get you to where you want to go. Welcome to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast with Bree Noble. Bree is a musician, entrepreneur, speaker, and founder of Women of Substance Music Radio and Podcast. Bree's interviews with successful female musicians and industry pros are both inspirational and informational. She also answers your questions about the music business. Bree is on a mission to help you create great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business, and to truly become a female entrepreneur musician. Hey, this is Bree Noble, and you are tuned in to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast, where we help you learn to make great music, to connect with your audience, and to grow your business. And today I talk with Jessie Lee Cates. She's a Nashville artist that's had a lot of success on radio around the world and just doing some really cool things with her music. And the best thing about her is that she's so grounded, she's so centered. And she really manages her career and her family and her life instead of just focusing entirely on her career, which some of the people we interview here, they're young, they don't have a family, they can do that. But, you know, she started her career at a time where her family is really important to her and she has other things pulling at her time. And so she talks about how she manages that. And I'm amazed at what she is able to do in her career while still maintaining that life balance. I know a lot of artists that I speak with struggle with that, especially being women. We feel like um, a lot of the the family pressure is on us and you know we're just trying to wear all these hats. And so I think you're really gonna appreciate her perspective here. We talk a lot about this in our Facebook group for the Female Musician Academy. And it's a place where women can go to talk about these kinds of issues that they deal with day to day in their music career. Also, if you want to try out the Female Musician Academy for a month for free, then I suggest that you go to iTunes and you give us a written review because we choose one person a month randomly from the reviews that we get to get a free month of the Female Musician Academy. So go to iTunes wherever you're listening and go to the ratings and reviews section. If you're on a mobile device, you need to search for us in the search section and go to the podcast then next to details it says ratings and reviews click on that and then go ahead and write a review and make sure to leave some information about who you are so we can get in contact with you when you win if you don't have any information in there then we do announce it on one of our episodes at the beginning of the month so make sure to keep listening and maybe we'll draw your name now to my interview with jesse lee cates here's some information about her Nashville recording artist Jessie Lee Cates began her career when she won second place in Kelly Pickler's Kellyoke contest in Knoxville. While playing at a pub in Knoxville, she was discovered by radio personality Mike Hammond and was brought to Nashville to negotiate with Equity Records. While the label folded shortly thereafter, Jessie Lee did not. She continued honing her singing and songwriting skills while working a 12-hour night shift at a factory. In 2012, Jessie Lee returned to Nashville and recorded her debut album, Let Your Country Out, that has yielded three top 10 singles in Europe and a number one international country hit, Behind Your Back. Jessie Lee has generated spins on over 2,500 radio stations in 32 countries. So that's a little bit about Jessie Lee Cates. What can you tell us, Jessie, about yourself that's maybe not in your bio that's a little more personal? Um, well, I think everybody knows, um, um, well, maybe doesn't know, but I'm, I'm a family, I'm a family woman. Um, my family is probably the most important thing to me along with my faith. You know, it's my faith and family have been the two biggest factors that have helped me a lot throughout the years in trying to pursue this career. And, um, 
if it pretty much if it wasn't for my family, I, I couldn't have made it to where I am today. Is this your extended family or your, do you have a family of your own kids and a husband? Or? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Actually, um, between my husband and I, we have three. Um, <laughs> so life gets a little busy sometimes, but, um, yeah, it's immediate family too. My parents, you know, my, my mom and my my stepdad, which he's, he's probably been my number one fan aside from my husband, my stepdad has. Um, I look at him like a dad, um, even though, you know, he came into my life when I was nine, but um, I lost my biological father when I was 15. And that was a pretty big, um, that was a pretty big deal to me back then. And actually that's where Wayward Rose came from on my album. I'm not sure mm. if you've had a chance to listen to it, but that's actually a true story. That's that's about my real dad. But I was very blessed to get a stepdad who has been as wonderful as he has and been such a supporter. So definitely. That's awesome. I'll have to listen to that one. I haven't heard that one yet. Oh, I, yeah. of course, dove in hugely to your, to your previous album and love, like my favorite is probably Scotland because I just love the combination of like the Celtic and the country. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. Yeah, so. that's awesome that that's one. That's awesome that that's your favorite because a lot of people are like, eh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> really? Oh, come yeah. on. Step out of the box, people. It doesn't have to be straight up country all right, the time. Right. So how did you get started in music? Um, well, it really kind of started when I was in grade school. Um, I did talent shows like in fifth grade and sixth grade. And then once I hit high school, I joined um, theater and I did theater all four years and I loved it. It was a huge part of my high school career. And I, I got the singing parts in most of the plays and different things that we did. And it was just I loved it. You know, I loved being on stage and acting, but when I got the chance to sing, that was really my moment. And I was like, okay. And then once I graduated, I started doing, um, like local singing competitions around my hometown, like little strawberry festivals and tomato festivals and stuff like that. And I was getting a really good response. And then I just, um, one day I decided let's try to do this for real <laughs> instead of college. Let's, let's try to be a singer. <laughs> Now, did you, were you writing music at that point? Yeah. Yeah. That's when I kind of started writing when I was about 19 and, um, you know, my first couple songs were, they weren't amazing, but they weren't bad either, you know, and I got the guts to sing them out. And I was actually in a, in a little band in my hometown. It, it wasn't anything huge. We normally played like the Moose Lodge or the VFW or something like that. But, um, I got to do a couple of my original songs back then and got a good response and being on stage has just always been, it's been what I love to do. Well, you got to start somewhere. Where's your hometown? My hometown is Morristown, Tennessee, which is about okay. four hours east of Nashville. East. Okay. I, I went to Nashville, but I went the other direction because I wait, 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 was that the other direction. I went to Memphis okay, yeah. from Nashville, which is like three hours one way, right? Right. Yeah. But I didn't kind of check out the, I mean, it's a long state, so I didn't yeah. check out <laughs> the other side. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you ever get a chance, you should check out East Tennessee, the um, the Smoky Mountains and Gatlinburg and mm. all of those areas. They're absolutely beautiful. I really do want to go check that out. I love Nashville. I felt like I felt like it was almost like the Southern California of Tennessee. I mean, it's just it, it was just see, kind of something I recognized in the middle of a state I didn't understand. But yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of people refer to it as the Hollywood of the South. So oh yeah. <laughs> Well, do you consider yourself now a full-time musician? Are you making a full-time income from music? And if not, what are you supplementing that with to, to keep your, you know, be able to do your passion? Um, I'm slowly working to become full-time at it. You know, it's one of those things that doesn't happen overnight. Um, That's for sure. It's very much for sure. Let's dispel all the rumors uh, yeah. if there were any. It does not happen overnight. No, it sure doesn't. In fact, it's a, it's a very long process. Like I've almost compared it to college sometimes. Like, you know, people go to universities to become a doctor. They go for six and eight years and it's like, well, if you're trying to become a recording artist, it's not much different. But what I've been so lucky to have is um, my husband has worked and he has allowed me to 
stay at home and he's allowed me to work on this as much as I can. There have been times that I've had to take um, some part-time jobs, you know, to help out, but my main focus has been my music and my career. And I, I couldn't have done it without him, without him having that support and being there for me and allowing me that opportunity to stay at home and to work on my music. Now, are you balancing that? Do you have you've kids at home also of, with being a mom? Uh, yeah. And, you know, they, um, the kids, I have two stepsons and I have a daughter and, you know, they go back and forth. And so it's, it's very hectic around the Kate's household. It's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one weekend we're going here, the next weekend we're going there. Um, summer is a crazy time. Summer is crazy because everybody is together. Um, you know, we have family vacations. We have the kids want to come to anything I'm doing. If I have a show, they want to be right there. And sometimes they can't, you know, sometimes you can't let the kids go to the bar. So, <laughs> so right. if I'm playing in a bar, they have to stay home and they get kind of aggravated with that sometimes. But both, now how old are they? Um, the youngest is six and the oldest one is getting ready to turn 10. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Cause I have a, I have a six year old and a 12 year old, so I know exactly where you're at yeah. kind of. Yeah. They're it's, it gets so busy yep. because they're doing all these that they're in soccer, they have piano lessons, they have you know, talent shows, they have all this stuff going on. And then you're trying to fit all this business stuff, music stuff in there. Definitely. But I wouldn't have it any other way. It keeps me on my toes. <laughs> right. Keeps you young, I think, because yeah. you're just busy, you know, doing it. But I would love to hear a story about, and I know we've discussed this a little bit over email, but of when, maybe when you were first starting out, when you felt like you may even want to quit because you're just frustrated. You feel like you're hitting a brick wall. You've maybe, um, you know, maybe been screwed over a little bit by some people that you trusted. And, you know, how did you come through that? And what did you learn from it? And, you know, what can you tell our audience about that that has, you know, made you what you are today? Well, the big thing is, is that when, when I first went to Nashville, I had this tunnel vision. And my tunnel vision was Music Row, major record label, get a huge recording contract, hit number one on CMT. Like I had big dreams and aspirations. And once I got to Nashville and actually started working the system and trying to get to that point, I realized quick like in a hurry that that's not how that works, that that tunnel vision has to expand a little bit. It's very easy to meet people in Nashville that say, I'm so-and-so and I'm so-and-so and I can do this and I can do that. And all it is, is it's empty promises. And, you know, I had a couple of those experiences and it was pretty disheartening. But if you just stick with it, you eventually find those people who are for real. And you start getting with the people who can help guide you down the path that's going to be best to get you to where you want to go. And also along the way, I, I had a chance to meet with quite a few major um, major labels and they were wonderful. They were great. Um, but the way they work and, and what they want from their artists and what they expect was not really what I was expecting. And it wasn't really what I was going for long term and career wise. I'm, I'm very strong minded when it comes to wanting to do my own music and wanting to dress my own way and be my own person. And they'll let you do that to an extent. but they they kind of want to mold you into the next thing that's going to happen in Nashville. And I just want some, I want to be different. And the big labels didn't really have room for different at that time. And so that's when I decided that it was going to be best for me to stay an indie artist. And, you know, hopefully after lots of hard work, you know, these record labels might take a liking to what I was doing or realize that different is okay and maybe revisit me later on in the future and come to me and say, well, hey, maybe we can work together on this or maybe, you know, we can give a little bit in this area. Um, but even if that doesn't happen, um, I'm really enjoying doing it my way. 
and I've had some success and I have a lot of great fans and you know, the people who are the naysayers that come at me and say that it's no good and that it's not going to go anywhere. You know, honestly, I just thank them. It's like, I have to say thank you because you just give me that extra oomph to just keep going and to prove you wrong. You know? So Mm. it's like the naysayers aren't getting me down. They're actually encouraging me. And I hope that's what any independent artist who listens to this will really take to heart because you have to have a thick skin. You get so many people who are just brutally critical over what you do and they can be really rude and really hurtful. And you just have to smile through that and you have to say, look, I know what I'm doing is good and I'm having fun and I love it. So you can either love it with me or you don't have to listen to it. It's as simple as that. (laughs) I love that mindset because You know, when you have the power to build your own career as an indie, then like you said, you can build it the way you want to build it. And then when you show those labels that you've already got this fan base, then they have to take notice. They can't say, oh, well, you got to do it our way because obviously you've had success in your own way. Exactly. I'm so glad you stuck to your guns on that because I, I can imagine it's there's a lot of pressure. Like they they show you all these reasons why you should go with them. And I can see where they're coming from. I mean, they are investing their money in you. And if they think they know what's best, then they're going to push that. Right. And, you know, so that's why maybe for a lot of people going independent, especially these days, is the way to go. Yeah, definitely. And with, you know, programs like yours, the Women of Substance, and there are thousands and thousands of other independent radio stations and all around the world and they are dying for new artists they they are they are hungry for them and they love all different types of music you know and they're they're so accepting and they're so loving and encouraging and it's like why wouldn't you want to to go down that path because it can't lead you anywhere but to better things. You know, if you've got this huge following on the independent scene, radio-wise, fan base-wise, media-wise, it's going to eventually hit something that is mainstream, even if it's something little. But you have to start somewhere. And if it wasn't for the independent stations and, and DJs and all of those different people, there is no way that I would be where I'm at today. So I owe all of my credit to you guys. And, you know, one day if something does happen major, that's going to be great, but I'm still going to go back to my roots to where it all started because you guys are really what helps build an artist who is trying from the ground up. Yeah, that's really our mission. And I know I found you a while back on Airplay Direct. Have you found good success advertising with Airplay Direct on finding a lot of radio stations? Yeah. Um, Airplay Direct has been great. Um, we've, we've used a couple of different companies. Um, you know, there's international, uh, companies, there's all these different things and they have helped me get Airplay on over 2,500 radio stations. Wow. Worldwide. You know, I mean, there's stuff in Europe, there's stuff in Australia, um, Japan, like out of all of these different places that could possibly play my music, country music, you know, (laughs) for that matter. (laughs) That's surprising. It's amazing. There's people been in Brazil, um, just everywhere that are, I'll get messages and it's like, hey, we're from, you know, over here in Russia. We're from over here in Australia and we love your music. And I'm like, man, even though I'm not hitting the mainstream American country radio at this time, there are so many more thousands of people that I'm reaching and getting to that are loving what I'm doing. And why not? Why not build an international fan base before you build, you know, one here in the States? That's just going to help. That's the way I look at well, it. Well, <laughs> now you have access to those people because you've got social media. Right. They can come find you. And that's just wasn't true in the past. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's awesome. So I'm curious, how did you, how did you get this going, you know, without a record label? Because your music is so well produced Like how did you do a Kickstarter from the beginning or did you bankroll it yourself or kind of a combination? Um, No, there has been no Kickstarter or GoFundMe for Jesse Lee Cates. Um, It's been, (laughs) it's kind of been a, you know, elbow grease kind of way to get to it. If you, if you will, when 
I decided that I was going to really focus on my original music and do it my way, I knew that I was going to have to sign with a PRO. And I talked to different representatives from ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And I ended up going with CSAC. I love them. And my rep there actually introduced me to... um, the man who is now my manager, his name is Vincent. And if it, if I had not met Vincent, if it hadn't have been for my rep at CSAC introducing me to Vincent, there is no way I would have been where I'm at today. It was like, it was one of those moments in life where it was supposed to happen. Mm. And um, Vincent just kind of scooped me up and guided me. And We co-wrote our first song together, which was actually Wayward Rose, the one I was just telling you about. That was our first song that we ever co-wrote together. And from that point on, I was like, this guy has the same vision as I do. He's got the same mindset. I'm going to stick with him. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, He has lots of contacts in Nashville. He's, He's been in Nashville and around the scene. And He's, he's very much a family man also. So he related with me on that aspect of life. And so it was easy to communicate with him and he was very understanding on certain aspects. And, um, he had some contacts at a studio in Nashville. I recorded my album at Beard Studios and these guys are amazing. I mean, top of the line. They've recorded Reba McIntyre, Randy Travis, um, Actually, I was in the studio at one point and um, Joey and Rory, the little country duo, I don't know if you've heard of them, they were there recording and I thought, man, this is so awesome. And they do mm-hmm. such wonderful work. And yes, there was, there was quite a bit of money involved when you get into the studio to start recording an album. But I had a couple of people who really had my back. Um, family and friend wise. And they were like, you know what? We believe in you. We know you can do this. We're going to kind of be a angel investor, if you will. And we're going to give you a boost. And these people, these people in my life actually just handed over thousands of dollars and they were like, (sighs) we're going to support you and we're going to back you and we don't expect anything in return. So go and give this your all and do everything you can and have fun. And that was like, it was literally like God saying that you're on the right path. You know, I have these, I've put you in these people's lives and these people in your life to help you get to where you're supposed to go. And I couldn't have done it without them. And yeah, it's been funded by myself and my husband and Vincent has invested in it. You know, it's been a real group effort, Um, but that's, it's, it's been done all internally and my group of people that have helped me get to this point. And I can't thank them enough. Wow. That's awesome. And I think a lot of times that's what has to happen in the very beginning, because it's hard to go do a Kickstarter campaign when you don't have any fans, like people don't know you, Exactly. you know, so now that you've, you know, you've invested in this album, you've got fans like all over the world because of all your radio play, then maybe, you know, you can do a Kickstarter next time. Right. And you actually have that fan base to draw on. Right. And that's what I'm hoping to do. That's what I'm hoping happens. Um, I think it will. I think when it comes time that I'm ready to do my next album, I think that I have gained a big enough fan base and a big enough following that some of my fans would be more than happy to help out. You know, I hope that's true. Um, so yeah, especially if you give them, you know, you have special rewards or perks or signed copies and, you know, things that only are for those people. I think anyone that's already a fan would be happy to invest in that. Right. Right. And, you know, there's there's a lot of people that I talk to and they're like, oh, I'm I'm not going to do Kickstarter or GoFundMe because I feel like, you know, I'm asking for a handout and I feel like that's not what I'm supposed to do. And to be honest with you, um, there's a country artist. Her name is Terry Clark. She was big in the nineties. Love Terry Clark. Love her. Love her. Yeah. I remember her. Well, she was ready to do another album and she was promoting it on, I think it was her Facebook page that she was starting a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter account to help fund her next album. Now this is a lady who has had phenomenal success 
in the 90s, was a wonderful artist, you know, and now here she is ready to kind of hit the road again and make a comeback. And she had no shame in asking her fans, hey, you know, help me make my next album. So I would really encourage people, you know, when the time is right and, you know, once they have their fan base and they feel that they're ready, don't be ashamed of it. You know, get out there, start your um, GoFundMe account or your Kickstarter account and really get your fans involved. That's a huge thing. If fans feel like they're a part of something, if they feel like they are a part of what you're doing, they're going to love you even more and they're going to feel closer to you. I agree. I mean, I don't see it as a handout at all. I think it's more of a partnership. It, yeah, exactly. With your fans. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And who better think, to have I a partnership with? <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, you can actually get some feedback from them along the way, too, which is kind of cool. Right. So what do you think makes you unique as an artist? I know it's, you know, there's so many artists out there and it's hard to stand out. What do you think maybe people say about you that's unique or, you know, catches their ear? Um, you know, I've had some people come at me and tell me that my voice is different, that it just has a different tone or a different sound to it. I don't know. It's the same voice that I've heard since I was born. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything different in it. But um, yeah, a lot of people have said I have a different voice. Um, another thing that's unique about me is that... Um, when if I'm doing a show, if I have to do like a cover song, um, I try to do originals mostly, but if I'm doing a cover song, I love to do male songs. I love to cover old Waylon songs and Merle songs and Johnny Cash. And I like to, you know, I might have to change the key in it, but that's okay. Um I love to sing Hank Jr. You know, I like I have female artists that I love to sing also, but for some reason, just taking those old male driven country Western songs and hearing it come out of a female, I just love it. I love doing it. I'm passionate about it. When I sing those songs, I have fun with it and I own it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And I think that, you know, them hearing that song in a completely different light, it's almost like a new creation instead of someone doing a cover song. Yeah. Yeah because it's a female versus, you know, the original male. And do you have any of these recorded? Because on Women of Substance, we do every fall, we do a We've Got It Covered um, series, and we go through all the decades. And I love to hear people's takes on different cover songs. And these aren't like karaoke. These are like real, like original takes on all kinds of cover songs. Um. Well, that's awesome that you have that. And I definitely would love to be a part of it. Um, I don't have any recorded, but um, here coming up soon, I'm going to start doing some uh, live videos on my YouTube channel and just doing, I would love to do some live covers, um, especially if that's something that you would like to see, you know, just, it would be a stripped down acoustic, you know, just right. me and a guitar singing some old Waylon. I just, I would love to add that to my YouTube channel. Yeah. And all you need is a, um, you know, a good microphone and garage band. You can record that yeah. for audio. Yeah. That would be awesome. I, I, yeah, because we, I've had a few like people submitting Johnny Cash or, um, Hank, Hank Williams and stuff. Um, and they, they're really cool. Yeah. They're really cool. What has been the most mind blowing experience that you've had as far as, you know, being an artist, as far as, you know, playing to a huge crowd or an award that you got? I've had two. I've had two really mind blowing experiences. The first one um, was actually way back in 2008. Um, I won this little karaoke contest and it was in Knoxville. And um, they told me that I was going to get to sing at the Foothills Fall Festival, which is a huge country music festival in Maryville, Tennessee. I mean, they bring in all the big names. I'm talking the Reba McIntyres, Jason Aldeans, Eric Church. They bring all the big names in for this three-day music festival. And I was like, um, okay. They were like, you're going to be on this little side stage and, you know, you're going to get to sing a few songs. And I was like, yeah, rock on. Well, I get there and they said, uh, well, come with us, follow us. And I said, okay. So they're taking me through the crowd. And I was like, well, where's the stage that I'm going to sing on? And they said, it's that one right there. 
and they had kept it a secret and I was going to get to sing on the main stage in front of 50,000 people. Wow. And I had not prepared for this. So pretty much oh. um, my stomach flipped upside down and my heart started racing. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I've never sang in front of this many people, you know, and I kind of went into panic mode. But then I calmed down and they get me backstage and um, they were like, you're going to go on right before Jason Aldean. Oh. And I was like, excuse me? And, you know, back in 2008, that's kind of when he was getting started and, and really making a name for himself. And so I go out and I sang um, Down in Mississippi by Sugarland, just a driving, rocking country song. And I gave it my all. I was on the jumbotrons. There was people out in the crowd going crazy. I couldn't even see the end of the crowd. There was so many people. Well, I loved it. And when I walked off of the stage after my performance, Jason Aldean and his entire band was standing there. And I was like, hey, oh. <laughs> you, wow. it was just one of those moments like you, you don't have time to prepare how you're going to act. You just have to do it in the moment. Well, I think they did you a favor by not telling you, because if you would have been knowing that you're just like, oh my gosh, 50, you know, you're thinking about it for days. You can't sleep all that. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. So I'm glad That's it was awesome. surprised. But then the second one was, um, it was actually just, um, about a month ago, I got the opportunity to sing the national anthem for the St. Jude's Children's Hospital, um, Music City Marathon, the huge marathon that they have in Nashville. And that was 30, there were 30,000 runners for this huge marathon just to support St. Jude. And I'm all about benefits. I'm all about raising money for, for different, you know, especially childhood cancer. Um, and they were like, yeah, we would love for you to do the anthem. And then I got to do about an hour and a half set afterwards wow. um, on the route. Like while the runners were running by, I got to be the entertainment. And it was like, gee whiz. But when you're up there in front of 30,000 people and it's just you and a microphone singing the national anthem a cappella, you want to talk about intimidating. It's like, <laughs> it's one of those moments like you better not mess up. <laughs> So. Yeah, no, I totally get it because I got the, I got to sing at the at Dodger Stadium the national anthem, and it is like you look out there and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many people out here, and at Dodger Stadium they actually have an organist that plays, so you're not a cappella, oh. but it almost adds an, a layer of complexity because you're like, oh my gosh, I have to stay with the organist yep. and not be distracted. Like they they totally put you in this bubble so you can't hear the echo because the echo is so extreme. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like you and the organist are in the studio almost, but you're looking out there at all, you know, 60,000 people or whatever. And you're like, this is surreal. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's awesome. That's wow. That's great that you got to do that for a, a benefit. And there was that many people there. That's so great that they came out to support that. Definitely. So how do you book your shows? Cause I know that you do a lot of your own booking. What, do you have any like tips or secrets that you can share? Oh my goodness. Booking your own shows is its own complete monster. And <laughs> I say that as, you know, with all the humor that I can, but honestly, it is tough work. You know, if you're not, if these artists, if you're not going to have a booking agent, if you can't acquire a booking agent, you know, it's hard, it's tough to get one. You know, it, it's kind of like these booking agents want to see that you've already played out live and booked your own stuff before they'll help you book. And it's like, wait a minute, if I could book my own stuff, I wouldn't be calling you and needing your services. So it's kind of a catch 22. Uh huh. Um, but you have to be diligent. Like you have to email and call on a daily basis and say, this is the 75th time that I've called you, but I really want to book this date. And I'm really hoping you're going to give me a call back this time. And I know that sounds extreme, but it's almost true. You have to be a pest almost to a point because there are so many bands who are trying to book the same venue as you are, even if it's in Podunk. 
like even if it's in the middle of nowhere, they're like, well, we don't have any openings for, you know, two months. And it's like, what? You know, is there that many local bands around this town that has 8,000 people? But, you know, they've got their own band. And, and when you're competing against local bands trying to book a venue that you've never been to before, you know, those bar o- aren't owners aren't quick to say, yeah, we're going to kick our band that we usually have every weekend to the curb and let you come in and see how you do. No, but because- well, and they wonder if you have followers in their city. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And if they don't feel like you can pack out their bar, they don't care about you and your music. They care about their money. <laughs> so, right. Absolutely true. Yeah. It's just, it's one of those things you can't get discouraged. You can't, you can't let it make you feel like you're not doing something right or that you have a really bad product or that you don't sing well. You can't let that get in your head because it's not that at all. It's just the fact that booking is a completely different beast that you have to attack and you have to attack it in a different way than you would say, you know, uh, trying to get on internet radio or trying to get on satellite radio or any other aspect. It's completely different. And you, you kind of learn as you go. If you don't have someone that has already done it and has that, at that experience, you have to do it yourself. And, it's tiring and it's aggravating, but then all of a sudden you get that one person who's like, yeah, I got this date open and I'm really excited. I looked at your website. Your music is amazing. You sound great. I'm looking forward to it. And when you get that first yes, then it's like a roller coaster from there. And you're just, you're pumped about it. You have a new outlook on it. You have a new attitude when you approach the different venues. And then it just kind of starts getting easier. So, right, because then you've got that confidence. I think it's just those first few ones that are so hard. Exactly. Yep. And and you know you I think you what you need to do is make a schedule. Like you were saying, you just you may need to call them seventy five times, which means every day you've got this list. You just go down the list. You call them. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you get somebody. Maybe you get an answering machine. You call them again the next day. Yep. And if you've got that system in place, then you will get. I mean, there's no way that you're going to call 100 people over this amount of time and you're not going to get 10 booked events. There's just no way, I think. Right, right. You might get, you know, 75 or 80 no's and you might think, I'm not going to make one more phone call, but that one more phone call could be your yes. And then once you get one yes, you're going to get, you know, 100 more, so... And you can also want, it's just that getting started. Like once you've had some really good ones, you can tell the other people, well, I've, I've played at this place, this place, and this place, Mm -hmm. you know, and that helps a lot. It does. That's huge for venues to know that you've played other places and had a good turnout and, and actually brought a crowd. Right. So can you tell us about kind of the streams of income that help you with your music career? I mean, obviously booking shows and selling CDs, maybe selling online, um, you know, merchandise or, or downloads. And then, you know, are you getting any income from licensing and uh, maybe other people singing your songs? You know, if you could just give us a little rundown on that. Yeah. Um, the biggest source of income is, is like you said, from live gigs. Um, you've got so many different, areas that you can collect money from playing live gigs. Not only the guarantee that the venue is going to pay you, but also tips that the crowd is going to put in your tip jar. CD sales, t-shirt sales, any type of merch that you have, um, people are going to buy it at your show. You know, they, not everybody is going to buy a t-shirt, but somebody's going to, you know, and maybe not everybody's going to buy a CD, but a lot of people are going to buy your CD, especially if you have a quality show. If you've got a quality show with a good band that's tight and put together and you present yourself professionally, they're going to buy that album because they're going to feel like, you know, this girl, this, this person, you know, is going to go somewhere. They're going to, they're going to do something. And I really like their music. I really like what they're doing. So yeah, they're going to spend 10 bucks on an album. Why not? Um, I agree. So many people say that CDs are dead. They really aren't if you're selling them at live shows. Yes, exactly. They are not dead. I am a very big advocate for a hard copy CD. Like, I love to have that CD. Yeah, iPods are great. And, you know, being able to look up music on YouTube and Pandora and all those different 
um, you know, areas that you can go to get live music. Um, I love those, but there's nothing like having that CD in your hand, especially if you're at a venue and you take time. If you if you have a break, you know, or after your set is over and you go and you interact with that audience, sign your CDs for them. Give them your autograph. Oh, yeah. No, you might not be walking around like Carrie Underwood or Eric Church, but who cares? They came to your show to see you and they have your album. So they obviously like you. Sign it for them. You know, make them feel like they are a part of it. That's a huge thing for me. I love signing stuff for people. I just, I love it. <laughs> okay. This is kind of a funny question, but I had this problem all the time when I was performing back when I was performing all the time, the CDs were still popular that are in the shrink wrap. And now yeah. it's a lot more toward the, you know, the cardboard, you know, thinner kind of thing, but getting the thing out of the shrink wrap fast enough to to sign it for people, which just drove me nuts. Do you still have like shrink wrap CDs or do you do more of the cardboard outside? <laughs> um, all of mine are actually shrink wrapped. I did. The, uh, yeah, I did that whole thing. I think you know it, what I mean, though? I do. I mean, as you can see the people like standing in line, just getting frustrated, trying to open the thing. I know. And it's funny because um, I found a way that you can take like a quarter or actually like the side of a key and you can run it across the top edge and it just shreds it off. And then the rest mm. of it just peels right off really quick. Um, that was definitely, that's definitely a downside to having the, you know, the crystal clear shrink wrapped kind of CD, but the look of that CD and the feel of it is I don't know. It just comes across as more, um, more professional. Like I took more time, uh, especially because the insert to my CD, it's, um, I think it's like a, um, there's like six, there's six different, um, windows. So it's like three, there's three on one side and three on the other. Right. And there was a lot of room for me to put my thank yous and give my credit where the credit was due. You know, like I was talking earlier about my little angel investors and the people that helped me along. Um, it allowed me to put the lyrics to all of my songs. You know, I miss that. I miss that in albums. I remember when I was a little girl and I would be, you know, singing in front of my mirror with my hairbrush and I couldn't figure out the lyrics to a song. I could just open up the CD case and pull out the insert and all the lyrics would be right there. And I noticed over time that started fading away. And that was a big deal to me. I wanted my lyrics in there because I wanted people to be able to see. I wanted them to be able to read them because you can get more out of them. If you can read along with the song, you're going to hear things or see things that you don't hear just listening to it when you're driving down the road. I, I do think that's true. And I remember, you know, having albums when I was a kid and, and pulling out the whole big thing and reading both sides of the liner notes. And, you know, it's just, there's something cool about it. And I do think it's important still for major, your major releases to have that, to have that booklet. You can put a few different kind of pictures of yourself, you know, just from different perspectives or, you know, different sides of you maybe. And, and of course, all the lyrics and all the thank yous and, and, you know, saying who all the musicians are. Cause I always read that, like, who's this backup singer? I really yeah. like this backup singer, you know? Yeah. But it is a logistically more difficult. Like when I was traveling, I would like, oh, these CDs take up so much space. And then I, I, you know, recorded a Christmas CD and I didn't need all that because it was Christmas songs. I didn't really need the lyrics. And so I did the cardboard outside and it was so much, e I could fit, you know, 50 into a box where I could only fit 10 of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's downsides and there's upsides. There's, I can see, you know, how it could go either way. The, um, I've, I really like the choice that I made. You know, it's like if you go with the the shrink wrap, it looks like something that you're going to buy off a shelf at a at a music store. You right. know, um, there's nothing wrong with the cardboard. There's I actually I looked at the cardboard and I liked it. And but once I got to thinking about how I wanted to present my album and the things that I wanted to add to it and make sure that people got to see and read going with that style that I went with was the best option for me. And you know, that might not be yeah. for everybody, but yeah, I can definitely see where you're coming from. <laughs> and I think it, I think it's based upon what the release is. Like if you're releasing a five song EP, there's no reason why you can't go with the cardboard. You know, you could do a fold out and you could probably even get all the lyrics on that because right. it's five songs. Yeah. 
you know, but I think for a major 10 or more song release, you probably do need to go with the shrink wrap CD. Yeah, definitely. I don't know how we got on that subject, but I, for some <laughs> reason, okay. I just started thinking about myself touring and getting the, the shrink wrap off and how frustrating it yeah. was. <laughs> so how do you connect with your fans on social media? Like you said, you have fans all over the world. What is your best, like what's your social media of choice and, and you know, how often do you connect with them and how do you engage? Um, Facebook is a huge, it's a huge help. Um, getting those, uh, private messages, you know, they'll like direct inbox me on, on Facebook or, um, email through my fan club email. I'll, I'll get, you know, emails from just random people, um, messages on my website, my website and Facebook and my fan club email have been invaluable completely. So, and you respond to all of them, at least you or someone on your team. Yes. Yeah. I think we, that's so important. Yeah. We try not to let anybody go unanswered. We try our best to. So that's awesome. That's, that's so important. I, tr I always stress that to artists. Oh yeah. So do you have a book recommendation that you would recommend? And it, it can be anything from something that helped you in your music business, something that helped you creatively in your writing or something that just helps you you know, with your life balance or, you know, maybe, um, just figuring out how to live better. Yes. And the, the book that I have held on to more tightly than anything, probably over the past three years has been, um, it's been my Bible. And I say that because there have been situations and, um, decisions that I've had to make that I have needed help from something bigger than me. And uh, there's been times that I've been really down. Uh, this career and this industry is not easy. It's not nice. It's not all rainbows and flowers. Not for the faint of it heart. It is not for the faint of heart. It is not for people who get their feelings hurt easily. It's not for people who think that they are the best thing since sliced bread because somebody in Nashville will tell you that you are not real quick like. And I have really needed that inspiration and that that help that it has given me. Um, I'm I, like I said at the beginning, I'm very faith driven. Um, I am a believer in God, and God has helped me and guided me through this so much and along with my family. Um, but one other book that I have referred to, um, it's this little purse book and you can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it, but it's called Soar and it's a tiny little book, Soar, S-O-A-R. I was going to say S-O-A-R. Yes, right? S-O-A-R. <laughs> and it is full. It is just a whole book of nothing but uplifting, inspirational quotes. And it's from it's from all kinds of people. I mean, there there's authors in there that they mention that made these quotes that I've never even heard of. Um, there's some from like Edgar Allan Poe. Then you've got some from like different presidents along throughout history. I mean, it's just anybody that has ever made an inspirational quote that really struck a chord with someone is in that book. And it's divided into sections. And so it's like if you're if you're discouraged or if you're lonely or if you're angry or if you're sad, you know, all of these different different genres that of feelings that you can have, this book is full of uplifting inspirational stuff to just help you out, to just refresh and recharge your memory and just remind you that you're doing something. You're somebody and you're doing something, which is more than the people who are telling you that you're not doing anything is doing. Does that make sense? Like, you know, oh yeah, your haters- What they're doing is just tearing down people. They're not actually producing anything. Exactly. And the biggest thing is, is that your haters are going to hate. And if they're hating on you real hard- you are doing something right, honey. I can promise you that. Because oh, I love this. <laughs> it's taken me a while to adopt this, but it's so true because there will be haters no matter what you're doing. Like you think you're doing the most positive thing in the world. There will be haters. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Exactly. And you just have to smile. And, you know, you can't, 
You can't go back at them. You can't be ugly back to them. There's no need to be ugly back to them because then you're just putting yourself on their level. So if you've got haters and they're coming at you, if they're sending you hate mail or if it's somebody, if it's a friend, if it's a family member, whoever it is that's telling you that you're awful or that you don't need to do this or, you know, whatever, just smile, smile and tell them that you love them or that you appreciate their insight, but you're strong. And you know what you're doing and you know you're good and you're going to keep doing it. And you just have to, you have to almost love your haters as much as you love your supporters because you've got to take from the haters the initiative to encourage you instead of bring you down. Do not let them bring you down because they're not doing what you're doing. They're not out here busting their butt and their feet on the pavement trying to get a gig that pays nothing down on lower Broadway in Nashville just so they can get on a stage to sing. They're not doing that. You are. So they can't tell you that you're wrong. And they, you don't have to expect them to understand that. You just have to tell them that you're going to do it and you're going to do it your way and you're going to rock it and they're going to see one day. And eventually they will. <laughs> yes, they will. I've, I've, ugh, you've, got, you've got your mindset all set. I mean, you're, you're just, you're right on. Yeah. That didn't happen overnight though. Let me make uh, that oh, clear. <laughs> I know. I know. I think that's important to note too, because yeah. it's a process. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that there were many nights that I would lay in the bed and I would just cry and I would be like, man, this, I'm, maybe I just need to go back to school. <laughs> but you know, then you wake up the next day and it's like, nope, I'm going to sing. And <laughs> you just keep doing it. I'm so glad you didn't. And, you know, go back to school. I'm glad you kept saying it. Right. Yeah. And I know there's tons of people out there that feel the same way. So I want you to let people know how they can contact you. And if you're haters, don't even bother because she won't pay attention to you. But <laughs> if you like her and you have questions or you want to check out her music, please let us know how they can do that. Okay. You can visit my website, which is www.jessieleekates.com. Simple as that. That's Jesse with an I-E, right? Yes. J-E-S-S-I-E. -S -S -E. And Lee uh -huh. is L-E-E. -E. Not L E A. I had some Kate's is with a C. Uh huh. Yes. And this will be all in our show notes too, so people can look it up. But you know, if you're listening while you're on, you know, on a walk or something. Right. Yeah. Um, they can reach me on there. They can reach me at um my fan club email, which is J L C, just the my initials, um, fan club at gmail dot com. Awesome. Um, that's a really easy way to get to me real quick because that's an email that gets checked daily. So, um, you know, that's a real quick, quick way and, or message me on Facebook. You know what? Like if you just want to give me a shout out, like tag me on Facebook, I'm on Facebook, Jesse Lee Cates and, or Twitter, you know, I'm very, very social media involved. So if you, I'm not hard to get a hold of, you know, it's not like I have this group of people who are building up a wall that says, no, you can't reach her. I'm here guys. Like I'm a normal person. <laughs> so Just hit me up on Facebook or you can email me website, Twitter. I'm there. That's great. And we will, of course, tag you when we post everything about this yeah. episode. Yes. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Oh. Um, you know, we finally got this together. I think we've been talking about it for about a month, but I'm so glad we finally got together and it's been so great to talk to you. And, you know, I've been watching your career over the past few, few years and I'm just so impressed. And now that I you know, met you as a person, I'm even more impressed. Oh, thank you so much, Brie. And I, I have to thank you because it's, it's radio shows like yours and it's people like you that make it possible for people like me to do what we do. And, you know, you really, you, you give indie artists that hope that we can still do something that, you know, we don't have to have that major label. And if it gets to that point with some of us, then that is amazing because that's everybody's goal as an independent artist is to get out there and get known. And it's because of you guys that we can do that. So you are a great asset and you are so much appreciated. And I love your shows. I love what you do. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. I, I love what I do. So I'm, I'm very happy to take that compliment. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. And this has been Jesse Lee Cates. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. 
Now go out and make great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business. Female Entrepreneur Musician has been brought to you by femusician.com and femalemusicianacademy.com. With editing by Jen Eads of 317 Sound Design and music by Stella Ronson.